nearly a thousand miles. Hey, Mayor Rom, did you say miles? <laughs> <laughs> nearly a thousand miles. You did. <laughs> miles is on the show today. How interesting. Uh, uh, <laughs> How did he know? <laughs> that Mayor Rom is something else. Your Ben Jarofsky show for Tuesday, July 13th. <laughs> Is brought to you by SEIU Healthcare, Illinois, Indiana. Nearly a thousand okay, miles. we're done, Rob. Uh, <laughs> the Chicago Teachers Union are sponsors, as well as the Chicago Federation of Labor. And of course, today's show couldn't be brought to you without the Chicago Reader. ChicagoReader.com for all things there is to know the city of Chicago. Uh, ChicagoReader.com forward slash Jarofsky, J O R A V as in victory, S K Y. Go check that out there. You can become a binhead and help support this show. More information, ChicagoReader.com forward slash Jarofsky. Oh, nearly a thousand miles. It's miles. Yeah. <laughs> it is Tuesday, July 13th. And live from my apartment and his attic, this is The Ben Jarofsky Show. Today on the program, yes, Miles Kampflassen returns and I believe making his podcast debut. Is that correct, Ben? Yes, podcast. He was in the studio, but this is his podcast debut. LaShawn Ford! And now your host. Oh, it's not his debut. <laughs> Chicago Reader columnist Ben Jarofsky. Hello, everybody. Ben Jarofsky here calling this I Love Bernie Tuesday. And here's why. Great weekend. You have a good weekend, D? Yes, I did. Uh, I knew yes, you were on that did. bicycle riding here, there, everywhere, smoking reefer. All <laughs> no, that okay, kind of stuff. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, it's true. <laughs> Maybe he was smoking reefer. I saw No Sudden Move, Run, Don't Walk, latest Don Cheadle movie. Oh, man, what a great flick. It's basically a gangster movie with political overtones. How did Detroit get to be Detroit? The games the powerful people play to make themselves get rich and stay rich. The hell with everyone else. Run, Don't Walk, Don Cheadle's latest also saw Summer of Soul, went to a movie theater, wore a mask. You could see it on Hulu, but it's better in the big screen, just saying. Another run, don't walker. Harlem Cultural Festival of the 69, Questlove directed. My favorite part, I wrote about this for the reader. It's like a little segment. I mean, I mean it's it's a concert flick about a, a, a uh, from 69, a cultural festival held in Harlem, 69. All my favorite 60s groups are there, a lot of them anyway. But there's this little uh, snippet, this tangent he goes on, where man walks on the moon. Okay, Neil Armstrong descends to the moon right on July 20th, 1969, right in the middle of the, the Harlem Festival. Nobody cares, at least in Harlem. And I'm like, I, I agree. What a waste of money. I'm saying the same thing. Speaking of which, shout out to Rex Hupke in the Tribune. This dude is hilarious. Right now, he's the only reason. No, oh, no, Greg Pratt does a great job of covering City Hall and Michael Hawthorne. But he's really, he makes me feel okay about that sub subscription to the Tribune. He wrote a hilarious piece today. Let's guilt Branson, Bezos, and space tourists into making charitable donations before they leave Earth. He has this one line that had me laughing out loud. Here we go. Uh, it's all about these rich guys who spend all their money flying up into space. Instead of like, I don't know, donating their money to help poor people. Just give it away. If you're going to throw it away, give it away. I know Miles Camplas can use a little help every night, you know, with the rent and stuff. Uh, here's what he says. Before I go, <clears throat> before going on, I'd like to stress I have no problem with rich people. When the revolution comes, I'm sure they'll taste delicious. That is funny. Come on, guys. Admit that Rex Hupke's funny. <laughs> it's funny <laughs> when the revolution comes. Anyway. Speaking of entertainment columns, a masterpiece by Maureen Dowd on Bernie Sanders. And a masterpiece. Say what you will about Maureen Dowd, but she's one of the best columnists around. She really knows how to write a funny column and, you know, an insightful column. Standing ovation to Bernie Sanders. I love Bernie Sanders. I voted for him twice, but there's a reason. Not just because he's another pretty face. Say what you will about Bernie. And I know how my moderate friends, my centrist friends can't stand him because they insist that he's the reason Hillary lost, even though that's a figment of their imagination. Just saying, centrist, you got to get over that. Bernie is relentless in all the right ways. Maureen Dowd's column, which I urge everybody to check out, starts like this. Quote, we settle into a retro yellow booth at Henry's Diner in Vermont, and I pull out a thick sheaf of questions. Eyeing it suspiciously, he asks with that booming Brooklyn accent, you give it a speech. 
That's classic Bernie. He's lived in Vermont for over 50 years, and he still talks like a New Yorker. Ever knows how like people go on vacation to England for a week, and they come back with an accent? Hello, mate. Not Bernie. And she writes, he reaches into his shirt pocket and pulls out his own piece of paper, a list of items written in his loopy scroll. These are the only things he's here to talk about, end of quote. Yes, the piece of paper. He wrote his talking points on a piece of paper. How retro. I can relate. I write everything on a piece of paper. I'm not going to show Miles. Here is the piece of paper that I wrote everything. I got a notebook. I got tons of notebooks. And people make fun of me. You're ancient. Ben, you know, you could just put it on your phone. <laughs> like, oh, it never occurred to me. Maybe I want to do it this way. Did you ever think of that? Gotta love Bernie, man. He's got his paper. He had the piece of paper in his pocket. I'm the same way. I'm like, when I do the laundry, I'm going through my pockets. Oh, my God. Here's this chicken scrawls, scratches that I wrote about a column. Walking down the street. Great idea. You never know when great ideas are going to come to you. You always have to have a piece of paper ready, folks. Anyway, she continues, quote, at 79, Bernie Sanders is a man on a mission, laser focused on a list that represents trillions of dollars in government spending that he deems essential. When I stray into other subjects, the senator, <laughs> the senator jabs his finger at his piece of paper or waves it in my face like Van Helsing warding off Dracula with a cross. Something you should know about Maureen Dowd. Yes, 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 she's a political columnist, but she's really smart. Okay, I don't mean to suggest that political columnists are not, as a general thing, smart. I'm just saying that she knows about things other than politics, especially cultural things. Like, she stays up on stuff, high culture, low culture, and gossip. Like, she knows who Dua Lipa is. I don't know who Dua Lipa is. I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing it correctly. But she's ready to ask Bernie about Dua Lipa, because apparently Dua Lipa has endorsed her. I probably butchered the pronunciation of that person's name. I want to be cool like Maureen Dow. Sorry for that. Anyway, she asked Bernie about Joe Manchin's yacht, and he says, don't want to talk about it. She wants to talk about the Bella, Bella Siaga fashion line, and he says, I don't want to talk about it. She wants to talk about AOC for president, and he says, that's not what I want to get into. It's not relevant. Let's talk about the things on this paper. He's waving that paper. And she says, you don't want to discuss Free Britney? Which, by the way, folks, is really funny. No, seriously, is one columnist to another. That's good. That's really good. That's a great transition. By the way, would it be funny if Bernie had a position on Britney Spears' financial legal woes? Then he goes into a classic Bernie riff as he digs into some eggs over easy and white toast, which is classic Maureen Dow, by the way, because no matter who she's interviewing, they're doing it over food, and she always tells you what the other person is eating. Word of warning, anybody. Like, don't go out to, for an interview with Maureen Dow and, like, dribble your eggs on your shirt, which is, I've been known to do from time to time. She will definitely put it in her column. Quote, Bernie, does anyone deny that our child care system, for example, is a disaster? Does anyone deny that pre-K similarly is totally inadequate? Does anyone deny that there's something absurd that our young people can't afford to go to college or are leaving school deeply in debt? Does anybody deny that our physical infrastructure is collapsing? Does anybody except anti-science people deny that climate change is real? Does anyone deny that we have a major health crisis? Does anyone deny that we pay the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs? Does anyone deny we have a housing crisis? Does anyone deny that half the people live paycheck to paycheck? He's so right on. He really is. What a riff. He just riffed that, ladies and gentlemen. Does anyone deny? Of course. You can't deny any of the things he says, and yet we're doing nothing about it. And he rips Jeff Bezos. You have the richest guys in the world who are not particularly worried about Earth anymore. They're off in outer space. People are sleeping on the street. But Bezos is worth $200 billion and now he wants to go on a spaceship. That's very nice. That's what his legislation is about. I want to talk about this legislation. Back to the piece of paper. And then he closes strong. My absolute favorite part of the interview, I'm going to ask Miles about this part, the distinction between liberals and progressive. Quote, liberals want to do nice things, and progressives understand that you have to take on powerful special interests to make it happen. One more time. Liberals want to do nice things, and progressives understand that you have to take on powerful special interests to make it happen, end of quote. Yes, yes, yes. Only Bernie, I would update this. I wouldn't call them progressives, at least not in Chicago. In Chicago, everyone's a progressive, even Mayor Lori Lightfoot. In Chicago, the word has no meaning. 
In Chicago, it's not liberals versus progressive. In Chicago, progressives are liberals and progressives are lefties. So it's lefties versus progressives in Chicago. But you get the point, and Bernie was right on for making it. You know, every time Micah, our good friend Micah, comes on the show, and uh, Miles knows where I'm going with this, he goes, Ben, the movement's bigger than Bernie. Yeah, you got a point there, Micah, but I got to say this. I love Bernie. We got a great show today, everybody. Miles Kamflos is sitting by the pride and joy of Whitney Young High School, Beverly, and in these times where he's an editor and a writer. And uh, later on the show, State Representative LaShawn Ford from the West Side will be joining us. He wrote a column. LaShawn's an old friend. He wrote a column, but he hasn't been on the show in a while, about the Bears. I reached out to him immediately. I go, LaShawn Ford, you got to come back on the show and talk about that. He goes, Ben, I was waiting for you to call. So he'll be coming on in a little while. I'll be talking state politics, city politics. We'll talk about crime issues. And we'll talk about the Bears, a little bit about the Bears, whether we should build them a stadium. I say no. We'll see what LaShawn says. Anyway, without further ado, Miles Conflesson from In These Times. Welcome back, Miles. Thank you. Very good to be here, Ben. Uh, all right. Uh, so you read the Bernie column, too. And everybody knows Miles has been coming on the show forever. He's a big Bernie s- supporter. Went to Iowa, knocked on doors. It wasn't in Iowa that you were knocking on the doors? I went to Michigan, too. And um, I was a, uh, some listeners may remember, I was actually a delegate for Bernie Sanders at the Democratic National Convention as well. You know what? That's right. I forgot that. And mainly I forgot it because there was really no Democratic National Convention <laughs> in the t- traditional sense because of the pandemic, right? Yeah, exactly. It was a virtual event, and I got my little box of uh, uh, Illinois for Biden swag from the, the DNC. So I've got that to remember it by. But, uh, yeah, unfortunately, they didn't fly me out and put me up this year. So, uh, All right. So um, let's see how you fare in this. Uh, I, I did not let him know I was going to ask him this. So this is the uh, Maureen Dow Trivia Bernie Contest. And uh, I have to admit, I flunked every single one of these categories uh, except for one. So, all right. Do you know, had you ever heard about Joe Manchin's yacht? I heard that he had a houseboat, yes. And, you know, he's been reamed for uh, for this from constituents and activists and organizers. You know, Manchin is a big target right now of especially the Poor People's Campaign led by the Reverend William Barber, um, they've been working overtime to really not just pressure Manchin over filibuster reform and voting rights and this infrastructure bill, but actually uh, activating his constituents, you know, because there's plenty of not just lefty people in West Virginia, but people just want to see action done and want him to start, you know, getting in line with Democratic priorities. Uh, so they've been pointing out that Manchin might be a little bit out of touch considering he's a, he's a houseboat guy. You might remember they used to hate on Bernie for having like two houses. He had like one like little, you know, <laughs> it looked like a shack in the woods or something. And people were up in arms saying, oh, Bernie with tons of houses. But yeah, Joe Manchin, is he's, he's, he's more of a houseboat kind of guy, I guess. No, Republicans hating on Democrats who aren't dead broke is an old yeah. standard in politics. Uh, and I get a lot of it myself. And I, I'm like not even closely. When I've, I, think I've, I may have told you this. It's been so long since I had lunch with anyone, but I've been known to have lunch with centrist Democrats. This is like in the mid, like 2015, 2016 time. And when I, when I ever asked like what the special is or something, they would make fun of me. You know, like I'm just supposed to drink water and eat breadsticks because I believe that we should be equitably distributing money. Oh, God, look at a socialist. He wants the specials. You know, these guys have all sold them, sold out their souls so many times, Miles. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, that's a old refrain. I did not know about Manchin and the uh, the yacht, the houseboat, as you put it. And I spent mm, the better I wasted, I would say, the better part of 15 minutes reading about it and his defense which is that it costs less than a house in um, Washington would cost. And the Washingtonian, I don't know if you saw this, they actually did a fact check and discovered that his houseboat would cost less than a house. So, you know, uh, easy on Joe Manchin. All right. Well, did you know what Balenciago is? 
Uh, yes, awesome. that, yes, that is the the fashion line. They famously did. I think it was in back in what 2018 or something, like or 2017. They they converted their line, or at least they came out, and it was like a runway show. I mean, it was pre pandemic, so it was the runway show, and they just had like the Bernie logo. You guys probably remember with the little lines, squiggly lines underneath over a blue background, um, and it just said uh, Balenciaga. So you know they they definitely take took up some bernie style i mean that's the low key i mean bernie is a very um kind of old man people consider him grizzled or septagarian or whatever the term is but he's kind of a fashion icon the mittens you know sold out after the inauguration he's you know influencing the fashion lines he's like low-key part of our pop culture you know uh cobweb of all these different you know styles and influences and everything so uh but fair to say he did not want to talk about that with no. me by the way, I have to, I swear to God, I have to give so much credit, Miles. I had never heard of Balenciago. I had to look it up. I I got to give you credit. I don't know how the hell you ever heard of it. Uh, and uh, do you have any opinions about Britney Spears and her ongoing le legal battles? We should free Britney. And I think that that was, I mean, I'm glad Bernie stayed on message, but also he could, you know, come down on that and say that we need to get her out of this conservatorship because it's, you know, she had a pretty compelling case she gave to the court about how she's, you know, been under court control now for so many years of her life. And, you know, in, in public, she's had to portray a certain persona of being happy and everything's okay. But her social media, as she indicated, is really controlled and her public persona is. So I think we should free Britney. And I hope Bernie's on the cause, though I know he has plenty of other things to deal with besides Britney Spears' uh, legal woes. Um, I yeah, I don't know if he even knows about Britney Spears' legal woes. Finally, should AOC run for president? Well, that's, I mean, she's, I think that it's a big ask for, you know, one of the youngest members of Congress to, and who's, you know, she's just starting our second term to then jump into the presidency. I think we need to build, I think, you know, what the left wing should do. I think Bernie was a huge boon, obviously, to those of us democratic socialists, people who believe in a more, you know, egalitarian form of government. Uh, he was a, a, a central rallying point for many of us to organize ourselves around. And that was pretty incredible, but it was also extremely unusual. You know, there's not usually a huge national campaign that can galvanize the left and I think that we kind of maybe expect that that'll just keep happening now um, but really I think the Bernie both of Bernie's campaigns were lessons that we need to build out a stronger infrastructure on the left that can actually power a campaign through not just a single personality you know and that that uh, I think AOC is an incredible politician she's magnetic she's you know really she has shown herself to be down with working people and have that at the core of her uh, politics but i don't think we should expect that she's going to rise up like a you know savior and take the democratic party in a progressive direction i think that kind of work has to be done by um actual people out in the streets organizing uh yeah, I, uh, by the way, you're, with, whether you realize or not, are totally echoing your good friend Micah's themes. He's always talking about that when he comes on the show. It's bigger than Bernie. Uh, but I disagree to this point. Uh, I believe that it's a popularity contest, an election, uh, and people have to like the person that's running to a certain degree or uh, identify with the person or feel that the person has empathy for them. Or in the case of Donald Trump, that person shares hatreds for the same other people that they do. And um, as much as I and love Bernie, as I said, I realize after two elections that there's a limit to how popular the, um, the Bernie's message is with voters in this country. I have to concede that, Miles, because I was 0 for 2. And uh, maybe in 2016, you know, the scales were tilted against Bernie by Hillary and her crowd, and that could have had an impact on, but I, I'm not quite sure that even that had an impact on, that That wasn't the decisive thing. So, so to a certain degree, I think the personality of, which is what Bernie wants to avoid, that's, you know, that's the joke of it. I saw on this piece of paper, and it's <laughs> it's it's beyond the piece of paper you know it's beyond the the ideology it's beyond the 
the needs, you know, it, to a certain degree, it does depend on the personality of the person running and whether he or she emanates a certain charisma. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think that you're c completely right. The messenger is often as important as the message when it comes to electoral politics, because you have to galvanize people and you got to get them uh, to rally behind you, not just an idea or a set of policies. That's why you can't just have, you know, an empty vessel to be the, you know, face of your campaign. You've got to actually, and that's why, it, you know, Justice Democrats and brand, brand new Congress was so wise when they chose uh Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I mean, I know she was nominated by her brother, but she comes from a working class community. She had been an organizer for Bernie. She had shown herself to kind of have this uh, magnetism, but who could have predicted that she'd become not just a politician, but kind of a hyper politician. She like transcends what we think of as politics and that she uh, exists as an influencer across a whole series of, you know, uh, issues in life, whether it's, you know, pop culture and makeup or whether it's, you know, the, she's doing like re reviewing TV shows. She's able to intersect with uh, culture on a broad spectrum in a kind of a similar way, Donald Trump in a different way, but you know, in the, in the same sense that Donald Trump, plenty of people identify with Donald Trump and approach him as a pop culture artifact, you know, or a businessman or, you know, some kind of uh, something beyond just the set of policies he was running on. And I think that AOC kind of uh, operates in that space as well. And that opens up opportunities for building a lot of support. So no, I don't want to, you know, talk down the uh, importance of AOC as a, as a long term political figure. Uh, but I think throwing all of our you know, pennies or coins behind her being the savior who will, you know, lead us to the future to by a run for president, especially in the near term, that overlooks a lot of the work that's got to happen to get to that point. Yeah. And uh, I can imagine that if Maureen Dowd was having a breakfast with uh, AOC and asked about Britney Spears, Britney Spears would have an opinion. AOC would have an opinion on Britney. Of course, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. my bad. AOC would have an opinion. Yeah, I don't know Britney would. Have, yeah, AOC. I would bet have Britney an would too. But that's the thing is, I bet Britney knows who AOC was and probably has some uh, probably has some thoughts on her. And that's how you know you've kind of like reached that saturation point, right? In popular culture. I mean, the 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 flip side is obviously the the, the right has demonized her, right? So she's not an unknown figure. They've kind of threw their stock into making sure she's the face of the you know progressive wing of the democratic party and if you have you watch fox news that's all they talk about is oh biden is being held hostage by aoc or something so they've you know staked their claim on trying to villainize her i think that that i don't think they've done a great job because she's still incredibly popular and charming and everything but um but that's what you know when you have these kind of magnetic figures they come with all the kind of uh you know blowback you would expect from 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 someone like that which bernie i mean they hated bernie but they didn't really know how to like come at bernie right because he's just an old guy who's just talking about issues the same way you said do you deny this do you deny that nobody can deny that stuff so he's really great at sticking to uh the message which it's it, i don't i've never seen anybody do that you know just bring the sheet of paper and just point at it and what did she say she said he wore he was warding off her questions about pop <laughs> culture like van helsing or dracula or something yeah it's good stuff uh, but I do want to get back to one point because you initially asked about um, the the liberal progressive you know uh, demarcation stuff, and that came at a point in the uh, column where Bernie is talking about the importance of media, and this is something you and I, Ben, both deal with. Is that you, you, what, what Bernie Sanders often harkens back to is that the role of our media class in this country has, you know whittled down to just horse race politics, tit for tat, he said, she said stuff, and treating the Republican Party and the right as if they are, you know, equal arbiters of what should be discussed in the public sphere when they're just making up stuff about Donald Trump supposedly winning the election and fraud and all this stuff. And yet that's what our media gets sucked into, um, not just debunking that, but doing a, you know, uh, equal sideism or something. And what Bernie talked about in that uh, column was the importance of really for um, highlighting and foregrounding the pain of working people in this country and how little 
uh, time and space is devoted to them in the mainstream media. And I think, you know, both of us work in a kind of alternative media sphere where we're afforded more freedom to, to, to write about those things and to cover them. And I think that that is just critically important and there's very little of that. And it's heartening to see that Bernie, you know, is aware of how important that is and shaking, shaping the public consciousness around these issues. And I think that that's what he was getting at talking about, you know, why we should have more discussions, not necessarily I, do I think that talking liberal versus progressive is the most important thing? But digging into what we mean when we say certain terms and everything. So I am always happy when people, you know, counter the form of mainstream media that we've come to just accept as normal in this country. Absolutely. And, and I keep harping on this. And many times I have disagreed with my guests because they freely use the word liberal to cover absolutely everybody that like didn't vote for Donald Trump and without recognizing that there's a vast difference in that category, the different segments of that category. Uh, and in some many cases are at war with each other. Like in we saw that in New York in the democratic primary where the quote unquote liberals uh, were at battle with the so-called, well, I don't know what they were, progressives, I guess that's what they're called in New York. I don't use that term anymore, uh, Miles, because it's, as I said in my opening, it's just in Chicago, it has no meaning. The word progressive has no meaning. Rahm, Rahm Emanuel called himself a yeah. progressive. Yeah. <laughs> What just, does that tell you? I know that this. So, and he's by the way, right wing of a, he's about as right wing of a Democrat as you can find. The uh, the Tribune today, you'll get a kick out of this. I don't know if you saw this. Uh, they had a they what they they put snippets of different uh, editorials from across the country, and uh, thankfully to substitutes for the dumb editorials they usually write themselves. But anyway, this one's from the St. Louis Post Dispatch, uh, and uh, in this, it's talking about how in New York City, Eric Adams won, and how it's a victory uh, for people that they agree with. And uh, Lashawn uh, Lash Ford is hearing this. Lashawn Ford has joined us, so it'd be interesting. Lashawn, I'm talking to Miles Kamflatson, so uh, you, I'll bring you on in a little while. But you'll love hearing this one. Anyway, so they're talking about the distinctions between progressives and liberals. And uh, New York City Democrats here. I'm just quoting the this uh, editorial. New York City Democrats went to the poll in a ranked choice. Sim primary was similar to the one in St. Louis. Uh, by the contrast is stark between Democratic nominees, Eric Adams, and the progressive incumbents of other cities, including Chicago. Somehow or other, somehow or other, Miles, Lori Lightfoot is being depicted on, depicted on a national stage as the epitome of a progressive. And when they say progressive, they mean lefty. They mean like Bernie Sanders type. You get what I, They're like using Lori Lightfoot to distinguish her from Eric Adams. And that's what I'm saying. That's when I know these labels have no distinction. They talk about how Lori Lightfoot is rep stands for uh, like defunding the police and moving toward progressive models. And I'm like, I can't recall ever. Say what you will about Lori Lightfoot. If you'd like her, you don't like her. I do not believe Lori Lightfoot has ever supported a defund the police, either rhetoric Model, proposal, anything. Your thoughts, Miles? Well, you're right. I think that she and she would agree with you. I think that's been very clear. Um, that said, I think she would probably still call herself a progressive, and that's what you know. Mainstream media. You're right that they tend to use these terms in a way we wouldn't agree with. But I also think that they often just boil down to either how people self-identify and. Lori Lightfoot has certainly called herself a progressive, or they just use liberal as this catch-all term. You know, when In These Times gets written about, the magazine I work for, we, you know, I would say we're, you know, a, a progressive magazine. We get called liberal, you know, and that's just what they, because it's just a catch-all term that they can um, apply to uh, and whatever they whatever they'd like. So I don't think that you know editors or writers are thinking too deeply about how they how they use these terms. But you're right in terms of the framing. It is odd to see uh, Mayor Lightfoot uh, contrasted with Eric Adams when, in fact, I think that they both share quite a bit of you know outlook and general sense of how we need to approach public safety, which is putting more and more resources into law enforcement rather than trying to reallocate or, you know, approach public safety from a different lens, like a lot of more progressive and left-wing lawmakers have 
have urged. And in fact, just I think it was yet today or yesterday, uh, President Biden held this event with Eric Adams, as well as the superintendent of the CPD, who is, you know, tight with Lloyd's told by Lori Lightfoot. So I think that there's a lot more congruency between the Eric Adams approach and the Lori Lightfoot approach than you might have taken from that article you referenced. Oh, the editorial is absolutely. Yeah, I'm, it's so it's so out of it's so off target. I'm not quite sure what to do. It's, it, it just makes it difficult for anybody to have an honest discussion. You know, I mean, when Lori Lightfoot is labeled a defund the police type of mayor, uh, when she's the exact opposite, how can you go from there? You know what I'm saying? It's like you have to agree on a certain a set of facts. You get what I'm saying? One of which is not Lori Lightfoot is not a defund. That's what I'm saying for better or for worse, no matter what you think of it, no matter what your position is on defund the police, just as a basic set, where do we start our discussion? The notion that Lori, somehow or other in the mind of people outside of Chicago miles, Lori Lightfoot has become this lefty or progressive to use their term. And I'm looking for I'm going to have this conversation with LaShawn Ford in a little while, but I truly don't understand how you can have a honest discussion when you can't even agree on the basics. Y you know what I'm saying? So, like, for instance, let's talk about um, Eric Adams. I was I know we've I, I think I had this conversation with you. I probably would have voted for him second if I lived in New York. That's right. I would have been browbeat by all my kids and all their friends to, to vote for Wiley first because she was the uh, AOC choice. But I would have voted. I was uh, there's rhetoric of Eric Adams that I was attracted to uh, his backstory. I was attracted to. Um, but I know what I'm getting with Eric Adams. I know it's a po possibility that within like six months I'll be venting. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, but. I believe that that voice that Eric Adams represents has not been heard by the Democratic Party in a long time, and I believe it needs to be heard. Uh, your thoughts about Eric Adams? Well, he had the support of uh, many of the major labor unions in the city, and I think that that is the reason a lot of people, certainly um, a lot of rank and file members in the city, and you know. Uh, a lot of the communities of color in the far out boroughs uh, supported him overwhelmingly, especially as their first choice. Um, I think that probably had a lot to do with it. I don't want to discount the role of you know public safety. I think that I said this before, but the same way that the Chicago mayoral race in 2019 really became a referendum on corruption and the role of you know Alderman Ed Burke and uh, the potential ties to him through the. Uh, Tony Preckwinkle, especially during the runoff, that was really a laser focus of the uh, media was was on this question of corruption. And Lori Lightfoot had less entrenched, you know, relationships there and was able to you know, show herself as the reformer and present this, you know, new face, let the light in for Chicago. I think in the same way, the New York mayoral race became a referendum on crime and public safety rather than what you might expect, which would be this, you know, the coronavirus pandemic, the enormous economic downturn, the struggle around, especially around housing for working people, those things got glossed over and it became about public safety. And I know you've said this, Ben, that you think, you know, Eric Adams might be able to do a Nixon in China moment, right, and and actually reform the police because he's one of them. That's a real hope. I mean, now that he is the presumptive, certainly Democratic nominee for mayor, I hope that he will uh, follow that path. But I think you might be venting, uh, as you said, <laughs> about that instead. Uh, yeah. but, we'll, uh, but, uh, but we'll see. But I think that the, it's the same way in terms of people saw him as the best candidate to um, deal with the issues of crime and public safety in New York, and that really helped to, um, to to propel him into victory there. So I think that that's, you know, it's the choice that was made. I do think Maya Wiley actually wrote a really great um, op-ed last week, you know, saying humbly that she had lost, but also saying that it's important that they embraced ranked choice voting because women and certainly candidates of color did much better in this uh, most recent election. And obviously a black man, Eric Adams, was given, uh, won the Democratic primary uh, versus past elections in New York that have really shut out candidates of color and women. And I think that's a strong case to be made that, you know, there was, even though people will say that you know, Eric Adams won, and therefore the defund the police mo movement and, and 
the call for it is not publicly popular. It, because it was a ranked choice voting system, he still only got initially like 30 some percent of the vote in the city. It's not like there was an overwhelming uh, you know, rush of support for him. It's just divided up among, I think, 13 candidates. He came out on top. So I think we should be careful about drawing too many conclusions from just his win. But uh, but yeah, that's kind of my my take on it all. All right. Uh, LaShawn Ford is holding with us. So let's bring on LaShawn Ford. Have a little cross conversation uh, before uh, Miles heads off for his day. Uh, State Representative LaShawn Ford, can you hear me? I can hear you. How you doing, Ben? I'm doing well. It's good to see your smiling face. It's been way too long since you've been on the show. And uh, Miles Conflaster from In These Times, meet State Representative LaShawn Ford. Uh, LaShawn, I would love, love to get... Yes, you are lucky. We're lucky that, that people can't um, can't see us because Mal's got us both faded. He's good looking and he's got nice hair. I mean, <laughs> so thank God this is a podcast. <laughs> You're not too shabby yourself, Representative uh, Ford. Sure Pleasure to meet you. Uh, and I got my famous Bulls hat on. All right, I got about ten of these Bulls hats with Sean Ford. We're gonna get into the Bears column. We'll get into that. Uh, but before we do, let's uh, get your thoughts on this. Uh, LaShawn, I know you're a political junkie. Uh, you ran for mayor in Chicago, so you follow mayoral races. Uh, your thoughts about what went down in New York. Uh, Eric Adams uh, was uh, victorious in the Democratic primary. He'll face off against Curtis Sliwa in the general. They have a, a party system there, unlike in Chicago, where it's uh, nonpartisan. If you lived in New York, who would you have voted for, LaShawn Ford, uh, in this mayoral probably the winner and in fact i plan to be there tomorrow to meet with him and so i think that he's the right face so you got to have the politics is about perception as well as um you know the ability to get things done i think he has both the crime and violence in that city is going to need a black male like him to be the face and lead I think it's going to be very, very important that he gets the support at this time because there is transformation taken. And a lot of white people are there wanting to help. You know, white people are not just flying the Black Lives Matter signs because they want to just be fashionable. White people really want to see things change in America. And so I think that he's going to have that working in his favor if he wins. Uh, I just would add one uh, change to your sentence, one amendment. Some white people. Right. Uh, a lot of white people aren't flying the Black Lives Matter banner at all. Uh, right, right. Uh, but enough about my Thanksgiving dinners. All right, now, um, so. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's all right. just you, could, you could change it up. I mean, teach them. That's what we need. We need you to teach them. And um, that's how things are, are, are improved. Wait, hold on, LaShawn, before we go any further. Have you ever shared a meal with an out-and-out -out Trump supporter and then engaged that Trump supporter in some kind of discourse and then, furthermore, have done anything other than to inflame your stomach and give yourself indigestion? Have you ever, like, changed a Trump's... Have you ever had a conversation with a Trump supporter where they go, you know what, LaShawn Ford, I never viewed the world until you expressed, articulated that point, I see it. I've never been able to move anybody on the Trump side of things off of their You know, point. I have, I have. In fact, some people in your profession, journalism, you know, when I went out and said that we need to um, end teaching of history in our schools because it it is not being taught with the lens of what America is about, there were a lot of Trump supporters that thought I was crazy. But then when I talked to them, they said, you know, you're right. We do need to change the way we teach history in our um, schools because it is not fair that my children are not learning accurate history. And so, yeah, I think Trump supporters are human. And, and I think what we have to do is do everything that we can to teach and be respectful and try to get people to agree with us. I don't believe in throwing people out with the bad water because of, I think we need to just do everything we can to collaborate and convince. I, and that's what politics is about. I mean, we have to convince people in, in our own families 
to agree on things, but we have very little patience with people that we don't know and expect them to just agree with us. That's not right. Well put. And to this point, I'm going to bring Miles in and ask him this. Uh, LaShawn Ford, with perhaps without realizing, is echoing many of the things that Bernie Sanders said in that interview that we started talking about. Bernie Sanders was interviewed in the New York Times, LaShawn, uh, and he said that he's going to make a major effort in the next coming weeks to reach out to Trump supporters and show them how his socialist views would actually, his programs that he's advocating would actually help them from with college, with health care, et cetera, and so forth. Miles, this is a discussion you and I have had a million times on this show. Do you agree with LaShawn Ford that like Bernie Sanders can convince Trump supporters if he's just, just goes out and uh, speaks to them respectfully? Well, I think the politics is all about coalition building. And yeah. once you write off, once you write off any group of people as somehow too toxic to appeal to, you're just lowering your, you know, the pool of which you can build your, your support and your coalition. And so I, I think, you know, when you, especially when you look at polling on these policies, we, kind of, the White House has kind of moved away from this. But initially, especially around the American Rescue Plan, the COVID stimulus, Republicans didn't support it in Congress. But Republicans in the across the country did, you know, the, the especially when you drill down to the specific policies, the checks, you know, the the uh, fourteen hundred $1,400 checks, uh, especially, but all kinds of these policies were massively popular among the Republican voting base. They're just not popular among the Republican Party uh, uh, elected officials because they, you know, are at the service of their corporate donor base and lord knows that you know the, the, the corporate donors don't want to see us have policies that redistribute income or wealth downward um just this week we're about to see these checks go out to families you know through this uh child tax credit three hundred dollars per child for most uh families that includes poor and working class families that's going to transform people's lives you know if you have two kids you're certainly going to get checks for six hundred dollars from the government that's going to help Trump supporters the same way it's going to help yeah. Biden supporters. And, you know, and talking up that kind of policy work and the impact is only going to, I think, improve the uh, stability of those programs long term. Uh, the, the place that I think they got to, the Democrats in general, uh, have to do a better job is by taking credit for it, you know, and making clear that, you know, not a single Republican was willing to support that extended child tax credit. Um, and, you know, pointing out some of those things, I think you can have real uh, discussions once it gets into other areas of where Trump supporters feel very passionate, whether it's, you know, issues around voting fraud or whatever, that might be a little bit more difficult. But when it comes to those policies, I think that's where you can make a difference. All right. So, uh, We'll close out this uh, part of the discussion uh, following up on what you just said. I want to hear what LaShawn has to say and Miles. Miles, you just said when it comes to uh, campaign reform, new laws and electioneering, I'm, I'm listening to you and I believe you uh, that you can win people over by appealing to their common – the common interest. I want to believe both of you when you say that. And yet I'm watching a struggle being played out across the country. Uh, LaShawn Ford and Miles Conflas. And I'm watching a struggle in Texas, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, but particularly Texas, LaShawn Ford. They're, they're prosecuting a black man for having voted. He's looking at 20 years in jail for having voted because he was on parole and the law in Texas, which is very bizarre, by the way, parolees can't vote. They're like throwing, literally throwing a book at him. They're doing everything they can to vilify people who are uh, have done time and keep them from voting. How can you say that this system is open for compromise when the leaders of the Republican Party throughout the country are changing laws to make it more difficult uh, for people, let's be honest, for black people to vote and put more impediments to keep them from voting all in an effort to hold on to power. I'll start with you, LaShawn Ford, and then we'll go to you, Miles. How can you say that there's room for compromise when we're in the middle of this political battle? Go ahead, LaShawn. Yeah, Ben, I mean, there's always room for compromise, and what we have to do is recognize that it doesn't come easy. 
you know, to think that we're just going to snap a finger and make people see things our way is not going to um, work. And when we do that, then we start setting up our um, our differences into a war. And now we're not open to compromise. Now we just want to fight. And so what we see in um, Texas now is an example of how bad our criminal justice system has been. So we, it's a teachable moment, and Republicans have to tap into their their um, hum, human um, capital and realize that this is wrong, and we've been doing this for too many years. And so we have to have people from all parties recognize that this man is human and and that this isn't good for taxpayers. How do we want to put someone in jail? It's like cutting your nose off to spite your face. That's not good. Miles, your thoughts? Well, I agree uh, with Representative Ford, I think, on the point of uh, compromise or at least, you know, uh, some type of bipartisanship around criminal justice reform. That's one of the only areas that there, ha even under the Trump years, there was some yeah. common ground that was found. Uh, the problem is when it comes to these voting issues, because that is the primary issue that the Republican Party has decided to throw their lot in with, is be to become essentially an anti-democratic party, to, to make the foundational principle of their political political project being denying certain communities the right to vote. And I, I, it's hard to imagine them really moving away from that at this point until, you know, there's some more reckoning in the party. I mean, they just had a reckoning. Their candidate lost after one term, a very, you know, historically uh, erroneous type of result that you would think would cause some reflection on the part of the Republicans. But instead, they've decided to double down on uh, trying to limit voting rights for particularly communities of color, poor people people and young people. Um, and the only way to, to turn the tide on that, I think, is, not, you know, what the Texas Democrats are doing right now, they just fled the state. They're in Washington, D.C. right now to deny quorum. Uh, and they're being cheered on by national Democratic leaders, including Vice President Kamala Harris. But that, you know, leaving the state for a little while can delay a bill from being passed. But that's not going to change the structural, you know, forces that are actually causing these uh, uh, restrictions on voting rights to go into place. To do that, you need federal legislation. And there is the For the People Act right now that could be passed. Biden, President Biden's giving a speech on it uh, today in Philadelphia. But that's where if Democrats believe what they say, which is that democ our democracy is in a moment of crisis right now, and we need transformative change. The only solution is we can't re expect Republicans are suddenly going to you know, turn around and say, oh, you're right, we'll get behind that. They just need to find a way to pass that mm -hmm. bill. And, you know, LBJ did it in 64 and 65 with the For the People Act. And if Biden wants to be the type of pre transformational president he's claimed uh, to want to be, now's the time. This is where the rubber meets the road because, you know, there's an election coming up in 2022. If you look at Georgia, you look at Texas, they have these draconian voting restrictions in place. Those can be uh, preempted by a national bill, but we got to pass it soon. So this is now's the time. I'm with you 100%. Got to get rid of that filibuster to do that. Uh, Miles, appreciate uh, you spending some time with us. Um, thank you very much. Miles Conflassen, in these times, you can read his articles, articles that he wrote, articles that he edited uh, in these times. Uh, thank you very much, Miles. Thank um, you, man. Thank you, I'm, Representative Ford. Thank uh, you, Dr. D. Have a good one, Miles. Years, thank you. Uh, to LaShawn Ford. And LaShawn, you said something that I really, I know I brought you on because of the yeah. column you wrote in the Tribune about the Bears. We'll get to that. We'll get to the Bears. Mm -hmm. Whether we should mm -hmm. spend one nickel on that wretched franchise. <laughs> I'm a huge football fan, by the way, LaShawn Ford. But we'll get to that. I don't know if you're a sports fan or a Bears fan, whatever. But we'll get to that. But you said something that I have to follow up on. And um, I'd love to hear you elaborate a little more. You were talking about uh, Eric Adams, uh, who is the president of the Brooklyn Borough, a uh, longtime uh, police officer in New York City and uh, was the nominee, the Democratic nominee for mayor and probably the next mayor. And you say he is the exact type of person uh, that big cities need at moments like this to deal with the challenges of crime that they're facing. Please elaborate a little bit more on that, LaShawn Ford. Well, you know, Ben, I, I think that one, the most challenging problem that we have in the cities 
like New York, it's crime. <laughs> and the safety in, in cities like New York and Chicago and where urban areas are where black people are. <laughs> you know, there's just been so much crime, so much conflict between black people, conflict between black people and police. And we really need to make sure that I think that he's going to do well as a black male in that role, because somehow you got to connect with the people in that city. And I hope that, you know, not all, I think there's this tone that not all skin folks are kin folks, but, you know, I do think that he might have some, ability to go inside of these communities and some of these black people that's creating the problems he could communicate with them in a different way it should be a benefit if he's able to go in and speak to these communities and bring these communities together and give them hope and when you say communicate with them in a different way what would he say and how would he say it that would be radically different than any other mayor you know, at, for looking at where he comes from, I, I would think that just his pedigree, everybody talks about pedigree of a person that might go to Harvard, uh, Princeton, and all these Ivy League schools. That's good, too. But there's a pedigree out there that also is important to be a part of. And that's a person that, that has struggles, that's been in a struggle, that because of where they come from and, and the color of their skin, they have some experiences that could cross over to many different lifestyles, you know, where people are being mistreated or people are not quite a part of the mainstream economy. You know, there's something to be said about electing people that have a lens that could see challenges that people are experiencing in their life. You know, it's enough to be always electing um, millionaires and billionaires because you would never have dinner with a billionaire and um, because they have a different group of people that they hang with. I mean, elected offices are supposed to be of the people. And if you go back to that, then you elect someone like that to be the mayor. Well, you ran for mayor uh, last time around in the 2019 election. You were not victorious, obviously. Uh, <laughs> mayor Lori Lightfoot was victorious. That's why she's the mayor. And I know I, I said this to you before the show and love to get you uh, to amplify your thoughts on this. I know everybody, I think it was 14 people ran in the city of Chicago. I may, I may have got the number off, LaShawn, it's been a while. Uh, and I know that the people who lost uh, must be watching what has gone down in these last two years, where somewhere in the back of their mind, they're thinking, what would I have done? And so, LaShawn, when you look at the last year, and just think about it, let's take you through it, that what uh, Lori Lightfoot has dealt with over the last year, the COVID, the pandemic, slamming hard, totally unexpected, she didn't see that coming. Uh, George Floyd's murder, and uh, the rioting and the unrest that followed. Nobody saw that coming. Uh, and when you watch these things, particularly the unrest, the George Floyd uh, murder and the, the response and just the rhetoric that's emerged in the city uh, since then, you say to yourself, if I were mayor, this is what I would do. So what would you have done, LaShawn Ford, if you had been elected mayor? And you were sitting on the fifth floor dealing with these problems. Go ahead. Well, well, I, I tell you, I, I give the mayor a lot of um, credit. She was very thorough on her fight against COVID. There's no doubt she responded. And she kept the city as safe as it could be as it relates to the COVID, making sure that we did everything to try to get people the vaccines, and making sure that we sent the message out that we were not gonna tolerate um, businesses and people uh, violating the CDC guidelines. So I think the mayor gets uh, A on, on her response to COVID. 
You know, um, there was a lot of money given to the city. And, um, but then when it comes down to doing the job um, as the mayor of the city of Chicago, the struggles are there for the mayor simply because um, she's in a situation where she's, she's lacking enough people in the city council to collaborate with. And um, when you don't have people that you could collaborate with, it's going to create problems for you to be successful. So what I one of the things that you do immediately is you build a collaboration with the city council and you don't strip the city council of their responsibilities that they were elected to. And so you know that your agenda has to be bold and big and you're going to need city council to help you. So one, I would have never had a coming out party of, of fighting with the city council. Yeah, I could fight with individual members behind closed doors to get them to see things my way or maybe change my ways. But in order for us to be successful in this city, you have to have uh, you have to have some form of, uh, you have to have respect and you have to have the ability to, um, uh, agree. And if you disagree, you do it, um, in a way that is going to be productive because I could disagree with one of the city council members, but we could still find a way to make their ideas work. You don't just shoot them down. And so I would have definitely made sure that I had a strong relationship with the city council. As far as the crime, you have to be tougher on crime in the city and you can't sugarcoat it. You have to do everything that you can to um, send a strong message that you're going to be tough on crime with tough love. We're going to help those people that want help, but we're going to lock up people that don't want the help. And that's the key. Um, also, you have a city that you get most of your your um, criminals coming back or people that serve time coming back from state prisons. You have to have a relationship with the Department of Corrections to make sure that when people are coming back to your city that you have a release plan for them. What's happening? We can't just let people come back knowing that they have felonies and it's going to be very unlikely that they're going to be able to be employable. Now they're coming right back without a plan. So the mayor of the city of Chicago has to have a relationship with the governor and the Department of Corrections if you want to have safer streets. And I don't think that that's been an issue. Here's the other thing. You can't fight with Kim Fox. You have to help Kim Fox see things your way or see why Kim Fox is seeing things differently. You can't fight with these people. You don't achieve anything fighting. You achieve everything by working together. And I think that's where the problem comes in it. And um, finally, I, I think that um, we have this game database out here. We need to use that game database to mail every person on a game database and offer them help, see how we can meet their needs and become in their life. Don't use the game database to find ways to arrest people. Let's use it. We know who you are. So let's do a mailer like it's a campaign season to mail to them to try to bring them in for some help. All right, you gave me a lot to think about. I'm going to break it off point by point. But uh, I just want to say I got a message from, I think, Google Meet saying the conversation is going to end in five minutes. I have no idea if the powers of beer are going to strike us, LaShawn, and cut right. us off, but we'll see what right. happens. Um, I don't know if you got that same message. I see. Uh, yeah. yeah, you saw it. All right. Uh, wow, you gave me a lot to think of. Number one, you were alluding to her speech, uh, her inauguration speech. I think that's what you're alluding to at the Winthrop Arena in May of 2019 when she was sworn in. She ripped the aldermen. They were all sitting behind her. She humili humiliated them in front of everybody. Everybody cheered. Uh, yeah, I get your point there. Uh, I'll ask about something very specific, though. If you're the mayor of the city of Chicago and uh, there's people riding in the streets, you have decisions to make. She raised the bridges. 
okay, to, to quote unquote protect the loop. Uh, Alderman Raymond Lopez, I know you know Ray Lowe from the 15th Ward, uh, accused her of abandoning the neighborhoods and caring too much about the loop. I think Anthony Beale made a similar uh, complaint. Uh, if you were the mayor uh, at that time, would you have raised the bridges? You, you, you can raise the bridges, but you have to make sure you protect your communities. And it's very easy to say that that you uh, would have that you would have stopped the the looting in these communities. But one thing you can do is have a real plan to stop it. There is proof that there was no strategy for the west and south sides of Chicago. And so that's all we have to go on, that there was no strategy for the west and south sides when it's obvious proof that there was a plan for downtown and the simple fact that we raised the bridges. So now if you put the two together and say, what was your plan for downtown? We raised the bridges and we stopped. Well, what was your plan for the west and south side? Then you, you won't have one. And so that right there, my community, Austin, we lost businesses because of that. And I had a meeting with the mayor over in Austin and said, look, th these businesses are in shambles and I don't know if they're ever coming back. And I don't think that the police and we have protection over here. I told her personally. And how did she respond? She was, you know, I would think that one, you have to make sure you have good people around you to help you. Being the mayor of the city is not just about you as the mayor. It's about you being able to bring people together that's going to be able to serve the people every day. So it's not just about the mayor and the call is about to end. So I really hope that we keep the bears. It's ending very soon. Yes. And I hope we keep the bears because you're wrong. You're <laughs> wrong. We have to keep the bears. Okay, um, if this call ends, we're going to pick it right up. I know that. Boy, that was crazy, huh? Right when he said, if this call ends, it ended. All right, everybody, the Ben Jarowski Show will be right back. There we go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. All right.
right, uh, LaShawn all right, Ford. Dennis, way to go, Dennis. Yeah, Dennis is a hero. I don't know why that happened. I'm, we pay all our bills, LaShawn, I swear <laughs> to God. <laughs> well, you know, the way we did it in, in Springfield, we gave these smart meters so they could they just cut you off right from within the um in inside of comment and they could switch it right back on so you paid your credit card you sent your credit card and they turned it back on yes. you know that right it's yes like cable, your light bills could be your lights could be turned off from inside they don't have to come out and 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 put a lock on the meters anymore no no oh listen <laughs> when it comes to squeezing a nickel out of you they're pretty sophisticated yeah uh but thank you first of all for sticking with us i appreciate that we got to get to the i love it he goes ben you're wrong and then the thing died folks it did not die because he said i was wrong okay i can handle someone <laughs> saying i'm he wrong cut me off <laughs> <laughs> i've been married for 40 years i'm used to people saying i'm wrong all right now look uh, LaShawn Ford, before we get to the Bears and we have that discussion, and it's really not a discussion about, like, with the Bears quarterback, folks, or the Bears coach. It's a, ta- a discussion of what the state and the city should do to keep the Bears in the city of Chicago. That's the discussion, although we may get into I don't know if LaShawn is even a sports fan. Uh, but, LaShawn, you were really on a roll there about uh, crime. And I've been thinking a lot about this. Um, oh, my goodness. Uh, part of... There's, it's such a complicated situation. There's so many elements to it. But part of it, and I'm not saying it's a huge part of it, but part of it is just the, the uh, attitude that exists in the city of Chicago. And I think it's bigger than Chicago. I talk about this all the time. Like someone punches you, you punch it back three times. Mm-hmm. And it's like the notion that you're polite to people, that you're respectful to people. Uh, is almost seen as weakness in Chicago. So many crime stories I read about. Someone was disrespected. They come back with a gun. You know what I'm saying, yeah. LaShawn? And yeah. I see it play it out without a gun in politics. I, I see our mayor, oh, you disrespected me? I'm coming off this podium. I'm going to go right in your face to my good friend, Jeanette Taylor. And I just feel as though maybe we should pause and just take a look about how we all contribute in our own way. You know, I don't want to get too hippy dippy with you, LaShawn, but I do believe you put out a certain vibe and people pick up on it. And our yeah. last mayor was very gangster like in the way he dealt with people. That would be Rahm Emanuel, folks. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. the whole thing with the knife and remember the the famous sending the dead fish. And yeah. we put out a vibe in Chicago, like a very hostile violent vibe from our politicians the negative and harsh and tough i think people pick up on it i don't know i think it's part of a larger culture your thoughts yeah we have to change the culture from the people that it from the people that we elect i remember donald trump said look if they hit me i'm gonna hit them back harder and and that's not the way we need to do politics we have to get we have to improve and have thicker skin if we're going to get things done, I'll give you a perfect example. J.B. Pritzker um, and and the rollout of the cannabis. I blasted J.B. Pritzker on that and how it was a dismal rollout. J.B. Pritzker was a strong leader and he called me. And, and we've been working together ever since. I mean, I nailed him. And he didn't get upset and say, I'm going to nail him back. He said, Representative Ford, you're right. So... We've been working together to try to make sure that we get this cannabis stuff right, even though it will never be 100%, but we do hope that there will be some equity. I think we need to have more leaders like J.B. Prisker that understands that don't take the criticism to heart, you know, and if we do that, I think we'll be better off. And you have to use it as positive, um, what you call positive um, criticism. Uh, I'm with you 100% about J.B. Pritzker. He's got, I talk about this all the time. He's got an ability. He takes a shot to the jaw and he comes up smiling. I don't know. He must go home and yell at the ceiling or something. I don't know how he does it. (laughs) But by the way, you're wrong about the Bears, but you were absolutely right about the cannabis, the reefer. We talk about this on the show all the time. The rollout was terrible. Black people 
bore the brunt of the war on drugs. We all know it, LaShawn Ford. They're arresting people in Austin, your neighborhood, for the same thing that people in Lincoln Park were doing all the time. Yes. And when they came out to distributing the licenses to the vendors, no black people got any. We harp on this on this show. So, JB, yeah, he did fumble the ball, but he didn't cry like a baby when you criticized him, when Ricky Hendon criticized him. Do you, yep. you know what I'm saying? He, yeah, so and then because of that, we're on the path to getting diversity. You know, I mean, the criticism that he took from Ricky Hendon and all of the social equity applicants, he's a billionaire. He could have said, screw them. But he wants to get it right, and I believe he does. Um, and I think we're going to be there. I think this week you're going to see some change, and you're going to see some um, some um, new legislation possibly being signed that's going to help increase the diversity. So I appreciate him um, because, uh, to be perfectly honest, I was afraid of a billionaire governor, but we needed him to take um, Ronner out. That was for sure. <laughs> I can't remember. Who did you? I, I literally cannot remember, LaShawn. Who did you endorse for governor in the Democratic I, primary? I, st I stayed out of it. I wanted to endorse Chris Kennedy because of the legend of the Kennedy family. But for some reason, Chris and I couldn't agree on the need to make sure that the most pressing issues in the state was black people and the struggles in, in the city. You know, there are a lot of problems in this city, but believe me, if we can address the problems that black people have been having throughout the times in the state, believe me, the entire state would be better. It would be just better because crime would go down. <laughs> Shit, it would go down. Uh, you, you know, speaking of crime, going back to crime before we get to the Bears, uh, I remember uh, about five years ago, I think it was, uh, it's been a while. Uh, you advocated uh, bringing the National Guard to Chicago. I saw Anthony Beal, alderman in the Ninth Ward in the southeast side of Chicago, uh, made a similar appeal. Do you? Uh, what's your thoughts on bringing the National Guard uh, to Chicago to deal with crime? Well, one thing I I'm a I, I listen to the people. A, a lot of the people they don't understand what role the National Guard could play. So recently, I sent a letter to the governor to say, you know, in, in um, 2013, I formed and passed a bill to create a, a um, violence prevention task force. In this task force, we are supposed to bring together all of the stakeholders in the state on violence. So I sent a letter to the governor saying that the governor should um, convene the Department of Corrections, the state's attorney, the mayor of the city of Chicago, and the, um, what's that group? The National Guard in order to, um, in order to talk about it. We need to come on, on one page in order to deal with the um, crime. And so before we bring in the National Guards, the people need to know what their role will be. And I think everything should be on the table to deal with this violence in our city. You can't say no to the National Guard, but what you can do is bring the National Guard to the table and they could explain their uh, mode of operations and we could see how they could fit in. But to just say, hey, bring the National Guard and throw them in the, in the city, that's, we need a strategic plan. Yeah, I hear you. In other words, it's not going to be like, well, this is before your time. You weren't even, I don't even think you were born yet. 1968, where uh, they just sent the National Guard to the west side of Chicago and they're patrolling the streets. Uh, it, you're talking about strategically work out a plan with the police, uh, have the local officials, the aldermen know exactly what role the National Guard are playing uh, and how they're playing it, as opposed to just, here they come. Here yeah, they don't come. give them our streets. They can't have the streets, you know, but they can protect the borders of communities like expressways and um, stopping people from coming into the communities with these drugs and, gang and guns. And But there's a role that they could play. You can't tell me that we have trained people that can't help in this situation when we're asking people in these neighborhoods to help. We're telling them, help us fight crime. But we're saying, we got actual people that's trained in law enforcement and there's no place for them in this fight. 
that's ridiculous. All right, uh, we can come back to the crime issue many times, uh, LaShawn. Definitely going to bring you back. I'm not going to let so much time go, but I do want to get to the Bears. So let me s- set this up a little bit. Uh, Bears are on my mind. I'm a big Bears fan, as everybody knows. I got really mad at them over the last two years. Do a hissy fit. Stop watching them uh, because I f- believe, LaShawn, this is me speaking, not you. Th- I believe they are prejudiced against black quarterbacks. And so I said, I cannot root for this team anymore. They took Mitch Trubisky over Patrick Mahomes. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but Patrick Mahomes is one of the greatest quarterbacks that I have ever seen in my life. I don't know how anybody could take Mitch Trubisky over Patrick Mahomes. I made one of my official declarations. I'm through with the Bears. I'm not watching the Bears ever again. I'm a lifelong Bear fan, LaShawn Ford. So, but then, then they drafted Justin Fields, a black guy out of Ohio State. I said, I'm going to give him another chance. Okay. <laughs> you had a bad relationship. <laughs> you had an abusive relationship. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an abusive relationship. I'm the one getting abused. You getting that abused. Year, <laughs> year after year, I watch that wretched team mm-hmm. and I hope something's changed. Anyway. So, uh, so anyway, they, they, they drafted Justin Fields. Anyway, so then the Bears all of a sudden pull a power play where they go, hey, we just want to let the world know that we're going to bid uh, to buy the land where the Arlington racetrack is in Arlington Heights. And I, when I saw that, LaShawn Ford, I go, oh, I know these cheapskates aren't going to dig into their pockets and take a, a dollar out of their wallet for this. This is their way of saying, hey, Arlington Heights kick in some money to help us convert the Arlington racetrack into a football field so you could subsidize our profits with your tax dollars. And I'm probably going to use a TIF. They're probably going to use a TIF to do it in because I got TIFs in Arlington Heights. So I wrote this article saying, I can't speak for the people of Arlington Heights. If those suckers want to pay for the Bears, let them pay for the Bears. Not a nickel from the Chicago taxpayers should go to help subsidize the Bears at Soldier Field. I wrote that in there. Then about a week or so later, I read your article uh, in the, your, the essay that you wrote for the Chicago Tribune, uh, where you had a different point of view. And so I immediately reached out to you and said, I got to get you on the air to talk about this. So do you believe, LaShawn, well, why don't you articulate your point of view of what, how, why you think the city of Chicago should move heaven and earth to keep the Bears at Soldier Field? Go ahead. Well, I think we definitely have to look strongly at never letting a business leave your city. So that's one. You can't let a business leave your city if you could do something about it. And if it doesn't hurt taxpayers, you have to keep your businesses here. A business that generates incomes for the hotels, that generates income for the airports generate income for the restaurant industry and just generates tourism for our um, um, institutions like our museums. It's a destination because we have the bears. We can't lose that if we can help it. And that's my approach. I think that we have to be at the table with the Bears negotiating a way for them to stay here. You wrote in your article how much we've already invested in the Bears, which means that has to be played out publicly to shame the Bears about how they robbed the taxpayers. I mean, you laid it out. For them to leave now, after Mayor Daly, I think you wrote, gave them so much money to redo and to change the landmark uh, facility and for them to later on come back and say, we don't give a damn about how much the city has done for us. We know that that the city has given us uh, millions and millions, hundreds of millions, but we're leaving and goodbye. Well, we got to hold them accountable (laughs) as well. And I think that you um, laid that out well. And I, and I don't know if you took it, wrote yours based on your personal feelings about the, and your abusive relationship with them. <laughs> but for me, I, I, mine is all about the city. Of course, I've been dealing with racism my entire life. And I understand that the Bears, I, I've seen a racism in the Bears institution. But I have to look at it as a leader uh, that's elected. I have to look past it and try to get... Um, do what's best for the entire city and help the bears grow. And it looks like they're on their way 
to um, understanding the errors of their past. All right. Uh, by the way, keep... let me ask you this, and this is a simple, straight yes or no question. Are you a Bears fan, yes or no? Yes. Do you, another simple, do you actually watch Bears games? Yes. Okay. All right. So uh, I'm going to tell you right Bears, but I don't watch the, and to be perfect, honestly with you, I don't watch the Bulls. The last time I was uh, hooked on the Bulls, I tried to watch some when Rose was here, but Michael Jordan was, I think Michael Jordan is the reason why I used to watch basketball because I was in love with Michael Jordan. I didn't miss a game. It felt like every time I see a shot that Michael Jordan makes, I say, I remember that. I don't know if I do, but I feel like I remember every move Michael made. <laughs> well, all right, later. hold on. Before we, all right, now we do a quick tangent, because you put the uh, basketball discussion in me, and that's like putting chicken in front of me. I can't resist. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, all right, uh, let's go to the, uh, the, the Bulls thing is this. I have many friends. And I'm thinking of you, Cap, when I say this, my friend Cap. He's a Michael Jordan fan. My friend Cap's got a million Michael Jordan T-shirts. and But he can't he, – he, he's got such mixed feeling about the Bulls. And that's what I discovered about a lot of people in Chicago. They were Michael Jeffrey Jordan fans. They're not Bulls fans. My love for the Bulls – I'm older than you, LaShawn. My love for the Bulls goes back to the 60s. I'm a Bulls fan fan and i love what michael jeffrey jordan did for my beloved bulls okay and i really am mad i was mad at the bulls organization because they ran michael jordan out of town they did That's, can you they, believe that oh. i still can't believe it to tell you the truth it, it it's is that was that a dumber move than the bears taking mahomes or trubisky i'll get back to you that one little short i gotta think about which is a dumber move uh, so I hear you uh, about your being a Michael Jordan fan and not a Bulls fan. Uh, I can't help myself. I love basketball so much. I'll be watching the game tomorrow. But going back to the Bears, the reason I asked you, are you a Bears fan? Because you said something I, I really smiled at. You said we have to shame the Bears. As a Bears fan since 1966, Damn, I can tell you, right, you cannot shame the <laughs> Chicago Bears. <laughs> right. They're business people. They are business people, and they're going to do what's best for them and their business. But you know what? I think that what we can do is play it out in the public so that the people in Arlington Heights know just what you did. I'm telling you, you wrote it well. Be careful, Arlington Heights. Taxpayers, do you want this? And the people in Arlington Heights could speak out strongly against it. They could go, and it could be a roadblock if Chicago and the mayor plays the cards right. Don't do deals behind closed doors with these guys. They will run circles around, and they will win. We have to do everything we can to negotiate publicly so that people know when things fell apart and why. Because the last thing this mayor needs is to have on her watch, as we talked about, Ben, that she lost the Bears during her tenure. And oh, there's got to be a good reason why the Bears left. They left because they wanted to rob the taxpayers. That's the message that we got to get. Listen, if Arlington Heights is foolish enough to take money from its public schools to give to the Chicago Bears, and they give them so much money that the Bears can't say no, then I would say to any mayor, I would say to Mayor Lori Lightfoot, Mayor LaShawn Ford, Mayor Willie Wilson, Mayor Tony Preckwick, whoever the mayor is, I would say, you know what? I can't hold you accountable for this. If the people of Arlington Heights are so foolish as to sign on to this deal where they take money from public education to give it to this wretched football team, that could not tell the difference between a great quarterback, Patrick Mahomes, and a horrible quarterback, Mitch Trubisky, then you know what, Arlington Heights? Nothing I could do about it. I would not hold that against – if if you were the mayor, LaShawn Ford, I would not hold that against you. Right. You know? Thank you. <laughs> All right. I We have to close down the show. I'm going to uh, end it with this, though. I wanted to ask you uh, before we uh, we leave about the legislative maps – and the whole process of drawing uh, new maps. Uh, 
The Republicans have been crying a lot about this, LaShawn, and I know you preach that we should try to do our best to get along with everybody, uh, including Republicans. It's LaShawn Ford, always be nice to Republican week. Uh, So let me ask you this. Do you think that the Republicans have any credibility for those crocodile tears? Excuse me, for the tears they're shedding over the the the, the legislative maps uh, that the re- Democrats are drawing up. Go ahead, LaShawn Ford. Well, Ben, the Republicans have, they, they were elected by the people to be a part of the process. They, I don't think they were elected to just cry wolf and to just complain. If I'm a Republican and I voted for a Republican and I knew that the person I voted for didn't propose a map, I would say, We need to vote you out of office. We need to go with the Democrats so that they can be a part of helping us get the best map for us. Because the Republicans are complaining, but they brought nothing to the table but complaints. And so if we let the Republicans have their way, we still wouldn't have a map today. And one thing's for sure, this process, everyone knew for 10 years that we were going to draw maps, that we were going to need a new map. And Republicans came to the game without a ball. So I feel sorry for people that vote for them because they are not even in the game. All right, so do me a favor. Next time you're in Springfield, you see Darren Bailey, you see Jim Durkin, give him a little tissue and say, this comes from Ben. Uh, this will help uh, you dry your eyes with those crocodile tears. Uh, <laughs> you got it, my man. Thank you so much, and I look forward to um, seeing you again. All right, very good. That's a great LaShawn Ford. Thanks so much, State Representative LaShawn Ford. <laughs> Uh, great job. Thank you very much. I also, I also want to thank Miles Conflassen from In These Times. He did an outstanding job. And the man, the myth, the legend from all in Illinois, man, he, he he kept cool and calm under a lot of pressure. LaShawn Ford uh, and Miles Conflassen will tell you back home on Alton. They call him Dr. D. Give yourself a raise. Take it out of petty cash. See you tomorrow, everybody. Thank you.